I want to introduce to you our keynote speaker for today. Her name is Michelle Munterfering. She is Minister of State at the Federal Foreign Office here in Germany, that is Germany's uh, foreign ministry. And she's going to talk to us a little bit about how uh, what the German government is doing, right? We're talking about the fact that most people uh, that are, are, are migrating because of climate change are doing so within Africa. You can imagine uh, what impact that is having on cities, for example. While the German government does have a plan, has been executing, here is Michelle Munterfering uh, to give us a sense of what the German government is doing in that regard, after which we can then open our conversation. Ms. Mundwa, dear panelists, ladies and gentlemen, climate change is a reality. This October, the biggest international Arctic expedition of all times returned to its home port, Bremerhaven, six days ahead of schedule. The simple reason, where in the past eternal ice made it difficult to maneuver, there now was only the open sea. The Arctic temperature is more than seven degrees higher than it was 100 years ago. This has vast implications. For example, flutes, tropical storms, droughts around the world. This shows climate change is far more than an environmental issue. It has crucial implications for the economy, for peace and stability, for security and migration policy. It has therefore become one of the determining factors of foreign policy at large. The impact of climate change is real, not last in Africa. It is estimated then to to 9% of Africa's GDP is spent on mitigating the impact of climate disasters already today. In the Sahel, the situation is even more dramatic. In 2019, over 3 million people were newly displaced in sub-Saharan Africa. This is the highest figure ever recorded for this region. Nearly 2 million people in sub-Saharan Africa are permanently living in prolonged displacement due to natural disasters. If we fail to act now, we will have to face the consequences tomorrow. That is why Germany supports initiatives such as the platform on disaster dis displacement. It is crucial that we work together multilaterally to ease the effects of climate change. We first and foremost have to reach a general consensus what implications climate change has. It has been a big success in that regard to include a strong reference to disaster displacement due to climate change in the global compact for migration. Also, we have to support projects on the ground. As Federal Foreign Office, we are funding, for example, projects led by the International Organization for Migration to provide shelter for individuals displaced by flooding or other disasters. We also have to improve risk assessment and early warning. This will help us better understand the interplay between climate change and security. That's a precondition for reacting promptly and appropriately to new security threats. As Federal Foreign Office, we have so far put a particular focus on the Sahel, the Horn of Africa and the Lake Chad region. What else should be the priorities for the way forward? First, it's crucial to make sure existing policies and frameworks, such as the Sendai Framework for Disaster Risk redu Reduction or the Agenda 2030 are implemented. Second, it is important that countries include persons who are internally displaced because of disasters in their national legislation so that they receive adequate protection and assistance. And third, we need to strengthen climate change mitigation and adaptation action through sustainable development projects. In doing so, we can build on the mechanism of the Paris Agreement. And finally, we need to step up our efforts. 
within the external dimension of the proposed EU pact for asylum and migration. Climate change as a driver of displacement has to be part and parcel of our common European approach. This requires an enhanced and comprehensive partnership with Africa, with African countries of origin and transit, but also with African countries hosting large numbers of refugees. Ladies and gentlemen, climate change is a common threat to all of us. No country can withdraw from the effects of global warming. People lose their entire existence because of disasters. The political stability of whole regions is at stake. To work together to ease the effects of climate change is therefore a question of humanity, but also of political rationality. Thank you very much to Michelle Munteferring. She is Minister of State at the Federal Foreign Office here in Germany with that keynote uh, for us. Now, of course, you heard a lot of uh, facts and statistics from her. Um, and I did tell you earlier that most migration uh, on the continent is, is within the continent. One of the phenomena is that our cities uh, in the world generally are growing. But there is a pattern of people leaving rural areas where, of course, livelihoods are being compromised because of climate change and seeking better prospects in the cities. So African cities are growing at a very rapid rate, and we'll be talking about that. But I do want to pose a, a question to you. This is a bit of a, I don't know, quiz night question, uh, so to say. Uh, let's see who can get this one. So of the world's uh, 15 fastest growing cities, how many do you think are in Africa? Now, I know that you could Google this and get it right, but don't. Um, I trust that you will t take a guess if you have no idea. So you've got, you've got four options there. You've got three, you've got seven, you've got 12, and you've got 15. So you give that one a go. Um, how many of the world's uh, 15 fastest growing cities uh, are in Africa? So we'll pick up on that conversation uh, in, when I have a look at your results a little bit later. So that's just one to get you thinking over there. Right. So. We will be having this conversation, of course, I'm excited to tell you about the panelists uh, that are going to be joining me in this conversation, people that I personally admire uh, and am thrilled to be in conversation with today. So first and foremost, I'd like to introduce to you uh, Yvonne Akisoya. She is the mayor of Sierra Leone's capital, Freetown. Uh, Yvonne was uh, poached from the private sector, so to say, where she worked as a finance professional for more than 25 years. Her public uh, sector work began when she directed the planning at the National, National Ebola Response Center that was in the 2014-2015 Ebola epidemic. Um, and of course, today she can tell us about the fact that she's a climate change fighter. And uh, Yvonne, as stated on her Twitter, is on a mission to transform Freetown, and she'll be telling us uh, some of that. We also have Dina Ionescu, uh, who is the head of Migration, Environment, and Climate Change Division at the UN's International Organization, um, um, uh, excuse me, Organization for Migration. Um, in 2016, Dina was awarded the Inspirational Women Working to Protect the Environment Distinction, that is, of course, a, a UN award. Her passion for migration comes from her personal experience, ladies and gentlemen, as a young girl fleeing France as a political refugee from Romania. And then the man among the women, uh, ladies and gentlemen, is Dr. Kanda Yumkela. Uh, he is a member of uh, Sierra Leone's parliament. He is a development economist and expert in agricultural economics. He has 25 years experience in that. He is the founder and chief executive of the Energy Nexus Network. Uh, this is a regional ecosystem hub for sustainable energy solutions. Dr. Yumkela served almost two decades uh, within the UN system, various offices, including as under Secretary General and Special Representative of the UN Secretary General for Sustainable Energy for All. So we are in good company, ladies and gentlemen. Before we get into the conversation, I do want to play you uh, a video that has been produced by my colleagues at Deutsche Welle that will sort of give us a sense of uh, what this conversation is based on, the premise of this conversation. So let's see uh, this video. And as soon as it is done, you will be hearing from the panelists as I have introduced them. When heavy rainfall back in August of 2017 caused major mudslides in Sierra Leone's capital, Freetown, they struck and destroyed Maliki Kamara's house. He lost his wife and he lost his daughter. 
Last year at this time, I was still sitting here with my family. We talked, played with the children, and now I'll never be able to see them again. No one is helping me. I'm suffering. This hurts so much. And it's over right now, and it's been pain. Eastern Rwanda, on the other hand, has been hit by prolonged extreme drought this year. It's apparent that climate change is real and increasingly dangerous. The farming seasons that people are used to are no longer predictable. At times, it rains where one expected drought or drought instead of rains. It's confusing. You can't just farm and have hope of having harvest. As it becomes impossible to live from farming, many people are leaving the countryside for cities, searching for a better life. But those cities often lack critical infrastructure, decent housing, and jobs that provide some kind of perspective. In Rwanda, there are hopes solar-powered irrigation systems could help. The aim is to install them in farms all over the country. They're cleaner and cheaper than diesel pumps, and they can help ensure better and more reliable harvests, even when the rain doesn't fall. In Freetown, the catastrophic mudslides weren't only due to a changing climate, other factors also played roles. People, we are cutting down trees and the forest which are protected, people we are burning charcoal there, people we are mining stones in that particular area. They also do a wildfire within the forest. So, so what happened? It weakens the swell. And because the swells were weakened, that was one of the reasons. Authorities in Freetown have now determined to plant a million trees by 2022 and increase vegetation in the city by 50%. That will not only help protect residents in the future, but also contribute to the fight against climate change. All right, uh, welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. So as you've seen it there in pictures and from, from the testimony of people, this is the reality on the ground uh, for, for many, many people. Um, and so, I do want to open this conversation now by inviting you, Mayor Akisoya, uh, to just talk to us about um, how Freetown has, is recovering from those uh, mudslides that we saw back in 2017. Perhaps you just want to give us an update on where the city is at uh, in that regard. Thank you, and thank you for having me. Um, I came into office, that, that mudslide happened on the 14th of August, 2017. And I came into office um, in May, 2018. One of the reasons um, for leaving the private sector and coming to run for mayor was the environment, one of the key reasons. And, and a consciousness that that mudslide followed about four years of annual floods, not as devastating as that, but with, um, with all of them resulting in a lot of displacement of people. Um, what we did as a city was, you made mention, or the, the video made mention of one of our Transform Freetown objectives, which is to increase vegetation um, by 50% in the city. And we're doing that through Freetown, the tree town, which is planting a million trees. But the initial intervention sort of seen was to minimize um, flooding, which was created clearly something of the of the nature of a, of a landslide isn't a quick fix. But there was flooding going on, flashpoint flooding from this abnormally heavy rainfall that we've all made mention of in pre by previous speakers in, in the earlier videos. There was this uh, um, additional flooding, which really resulted from the fact that we had um, drains blocked, we had gutters blocked, we had waterways blocked. So over the last three years, every pre every rainy season, the city now embarks on a, a, a process, an exercise where we work with communities for them to identify to us where flooding is likely to occur. Yeah. And then we, we use everything we have um, from the military personnel, the engineers, um, you know, bulldozers and front end loaders, 
and we clear those. And that's also tied with sanitation. But going beyond that, um, the, the heavy rainfall, which you know has been is a key feature of how climate change is impacting um, Sierra Leone. Freetown and other countries in Africa, that heavy rainfall um, is also uh, another feature of that. Another another sort of um, problem we have is inadequate drainage. So when you've got deforestation um, and inadequate drainage, what you have in mountainous areas such as Freetown is a lot of rain uh, runoff. So the water is running off. So it, it's a vicious cycle. What we're doing there is building a building stormwater infrastructure, and there's a lot more to do. We've started the process, but there's a lot more to, to do. And of course, planting the trees, planting a million trees, no small feat. We're halfway there um, in this in this rainy season. Really having built the systems, the tracking, because we're not just planting, we're growing. Um, but and then we'll complete that process in the next rainy season in 2021. So what we're doing is seeking to address address the, the issues, but the, these are really, really significant. Um, and I'll, I probably won't try and answer everything now, but I'll perhaps in the next response come on to some of the fundamentals that will ensure that what we're seeking to do by planting trees, by doing uh, um, flood mitigation activities every year, by investing in stormwater infrastructure, there, there is something which underpins all of that, which needs to be addressed, and that's adequate urban planning. Right, and, and I'll pick up on that note of urban planning, and, and Dina, rope you into the conversation now. Uh, we are talking about rapid urbanization uh, in the African context. Do you want to just flesh that out for us uh, in terms of what we're seeing in terms of the growing cities on the continent? Yes, thank you so much. I think what I want to bring in the conversation is how much, in fact, the, the impacts of climate change are in fact affecting contemporary migration patterns. And this leads, of course, very much to uh, uh, movements from rural areas to urban areas. So we, we have a, a, a circle of human mobility uh, with new strategies from people who have to adapt to a changing, for instance, rainfall patterns, to uh, lack of water, or on the contrary, to too much water with floods. And we see that there is a very strong movement uh, of uh, uh, going from the rural areas to our urban areas, creating increased vulnerability for people because people are moving to areas that are already unsustainable because of climate change impacts. And when we look at, for instance, the uh, 10 of the most uh, important uh, urban uh, settings in the African continent are uh, submitted to sea level rise and coastal erosion issues. We have this data from the um, yeah, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change uh, report on oceans. We realize that we are in a very complex situation. So this is the first thing I wanted to, to, to really highlight is the complexity of the migration patterns we are now uh, dealing with. Um, Another element I really want to bring in the discussion now at the beginning, it's nevertheless how much we are talking about very multi-causal phenomena. So climate change, environmental degradation, uh, natural hazards leading to disasters are very often part only of the equation. They mix with so many other demographic, economic, uh, labor issues, uh, with uh, conflict issues, and that creates a very important driver of contemporary migration. Uh, and the other point I want to bring in the discussion at the beginning, it's how much of this is a local issue. So it's extremely interesting to see the mayor uh, speaking about the, this situation. It's really about local uh, and urban planning and responses and in the same time it's really about multilateral discussions and working for an international organization a un organization an organization that deals with international migration that deals 
uh, with multilateral intergovernmental policy and dialogues, I really want to pass on at the beginning of our conversation, before speaking maybe of much more specific examples of how we address the solution, I really want to highlight how much it's about multilateral and local going hand in hand. And it has also regional translation and a lot of the work we are doing now on environment, migration and climate change goes through regional uh, dialogues and regional protocols of free movement and regional approaches, for instance, to transhumans. So there is this global uh, link to the local uh, link that I think are key and the urban agenda uh, that has been signed uh, in 2016, it's a key agenda that connects to all the uh, important uh, international frameworks we have, the Paris Agreement uh, signed in 2015, and the Global Compact on Migration signed in 2018, and that has a very strong language on climate change, environment, and migration. So we have this anchorage in the Global Compact on Migration, in the Paris Agreement, in the urban agenda, so very specific anchorage in policy engagement that has to be translated at the local level. And this translation, it's the key question, how do we do it? And what do we do in, in this direction? Yeah, uh, and, and thank you so much for, for that contribution, Dina. I, I do want to bring you back to that, that poll question that we put out. We asked you how many of the world's uh, 15 fastest growing cities were uh, in Africa. Actually, all 15 uh, of the fastest growing cities are in Africa. So, and maybe I can maybe just run you through some of them uh, right now before we, we pick up our conversation. You've got cities like Lilongwe in Malawi, Ouagadougou in Burkina Faso, uh, Wige in Angola, you've got um, Bobo Diosulu again in Burkina Faso, uh, Dar es Salaam in Tanzania, uh, you've got Tete in Mozambique, you've got Niame in Niger, uh, Bunia in, in Congo, uh, Guagadala in Nigeria, uh, Mwanza also in, in Tanzania, Songea another one in Tanzania, Kabinda that is in Congo as well, Kampala, Uganda, uh, Zinde in Niger as well as Bujumbura in um, Burundi. So I know I kind of threw uh, that list at you there, but you can see that this is happening really all over the continent. So this is this urbanization that we're talking about where people are fast making that movement uh, from the rural areas and they're seeking uh, greener pastures, of course, in, in the cities. Are our cities prepared? May, I do want to bring you back into the conversation here because you're now talking about what your city has had to do, Freetown, um, in response and into an anticipation of, of the flooding uh, that you are exposed to. But now you have the dynamic, of course, that over the years, more and more people um, are going to want to, to make a home for themselves and build a life uh, in the city. How are, you, how are you adjusting to that? What kind of strategies are you putting in place to accommodate the growth that's already taking place and, and what do you anticipate in the future? Where we need to start is just recognizing that, that what you're describing has already happened. So in the last 25 years, starting first with conflict um, in the you know, late 19, um, 1990s, and then moving on now to climate change. And as Dino said, um, the, it, this is complex, it's multi-layered. There are also economic factors. Um, we've, seen, we've seen our population in the city um, increase two and a half times in 20 that's phenomenal. Um, and that, that a lot of that has been a rural urban migration. Of course, some of it is just natural growth within the city. So we, the, the struggle of the city coping with a required infrastructure within a context, and I think this is the key, within a context of a lack of development controls and urban planning. So you have people coming into the city. Um, there, isn't, there isn't a plan laid out. There isn't transparency over land use and land acquisition. Um, and there isn't development control. So people literally have created their own spaces. We've got over 70 informal settlements which have sprung up right across the city. And as we know, those who are vulnerable coming because of climate change find themselves in the most vulnerable places because when you are land grabbing, when you are settling without papers, you tend to settle 
in areas where you're sort of out of the eyes. So we have people on the coastlines, we have people on the hills, um, and these are the people who are most vulnerable to flooding, they're most vulnerable to high water tides, but at the same time, this process is also increasing vulnerability for the entire city because it comes with deforestation. It comes with the cutting down of trees, the burning of forests, because Freetown's topography is mountains, plain, and coast. And the mountains were green um, and sadly um, are, are much more brown now as we've, we've experienced this deforestation. So what do we do? What is key to the solution? In addition to what I described, planting trees, uh, um, in, in, um, investing in flood infrastructure. What is key is actually having urban planning, to have local area plans um, and to have development controls, to be able to have permitting a permitting regime which prevents the building of certain types of structures in particular areas based on proximity to waterways, based on proximity to, to um, protected forest areas. And unfortunately, or, and, and even just in terms of zoning the city, one of the big challenges we face, and this is common with a lot of African cities, is that we are not, there isn't densification from a structural perspective. The cities are densely populated, but they're densely populated through informal settlements, which are very poorly serviced. What we should have is, plan, is plans, and there's an extent to which you would argue, but you can't retrofit. Yes, you can. You can have neighborhood upgrades, um, and you can, even within built areas now, um, have Re regeneration plans, which bring in improved density, improved transport connections, which make the city more productive in terms of its economic output, thereby creating jobs and helping those vulnerable um, in the city to have more opportunities. For me, the answer, one of the most important ingredients, which we'd love to be taking forward, but we currently are not, is urban planning. Um, and for this, we require devolution of the functions of land use planning, urban planning, and building permit issuance. Um, and in Freetown, in Sierra Leone, um, this is something which the Local Government Act devolved to the local councils back in 2004. In fact, in the case of sit in Freetown, Freetown as a city was established in 1893. Sierra Leone as a country became a republic in 1961. So the city has been around a long time and was, was responsible for planning. Um, but with the new act uh, and with the hiatus that there was for a number of years, actually, um, with local governments kind of being disarmed, um, we find ourselves now in a situation where growth is happening at a rapid pace. Um, and what we need to be able to help control that growth, to help invest, to help make sure that when we plant a, a million trees, we don't then have that land given to someone to build a house on and then have that the trees cut down. With, there needs to be, and this is true of, of cities across the continent, there is a real need for urban planning, um, urban policy, right. Um, which is aligned to environmental management uh, and, and housing stock, recognizing this phenomenon of urbanization is here to stay. If you're going to have an influx of people, you need to plan to receive them. You need to plan to deliver services. Let me just quickly stop here, but I want to say one last thing. The inefficiency of African cities, including mine, is compounded by the lack of planning. When communities spring up on hillsides and they have no roads going to them, you then have poor access to health, poor access to education. Of course, sanitation is, is very, very difficult to provide. And therefore, what you have, you have worse life outcomes. You have disease because of poor sanitation. You, you have 
increased, you have high unemployment from youth who are unskilled. Um, and of course you have high mortality. So the inefficiency of the design, the, the lack of design and the inability to provide services, um, the fact that so many of these these residents are not in the formal system, it's more difficult to bring them into the formal system, means you're building the problem onto the problem. So it may surprise people listening, but I actually feel that in, as we deal with climate change, as we deal with issues, we plant trees, um, we also really need as part of that solution to be planning our cities. Yeah, and, and thank you so much uh, for, for that meaningful insight, uh, Mayor, because one of my challenges is often when we're, we're reporting on, on, on some of the activities happening in our cities, we are reporting on, on, on local authorities evicting people, and often in a very brutal way, and often these people are the very victims uh, of some of these climate change factors. So perhaps we'll talk about some of these aggressive evictions that we've seen authorities on the continent uh, employ. You're obviously advocating for more urban planning, um, so less of these, you know, sort of inhumane uh, evictions uh, that, that we're seeing happening. Uh, Dr. Yumkela, uh, I want to bring you into the conversation at this point because um, the mayor was just talking about creating opportunities, young people uh, who not only come to, 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 to the cities for refuge, but want to be able to, 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 to grow uh, themselves and find opportunities. Um, you've talked about the fact that we cannot have development uh, without energy. You're advocating for energy and, and what the sector could potentially do in terms of helping us build and create wealth and make our cities more resilient. So talk to us about energy's place in all of this. Yeah, thank you very much for having me on the program. Let's look at the projections about population growth and urbanization from the International Energy Agency for a minute. Um, between now and 2040, one out of every two people added to the global population will be African. Okay, and by 2025, in another five years, we'll have more population than China and India. The projection also by the International Energy Agency is that by 2040, there will be an additional half a billion Africans moving into cities. So I just want to give Mayor Akisoya more headache to see more of our people are coming. And so, and we have some of the highest urbanization rates ever seen in the world. In fact, the IEA projects that that level of urbanization, half a billion more Africans moving into cities will be faster than what China saw in its two decades of boom and uh, energy growth. Now you put all of that together, you realize that in fact, energy demand is likely to double or triple by then. You cannot have climate resilience without economic growth, wealth creation, and massive job expansion. And energy, of course, is tied to everything. You need energy for the clean water and sanitation in cities. You need energy for the lighting to drive the industries that will create economic opportunity and growth. So you begin to see that nexus between energy, water and sanitation, energy and health service delivery. You know, hospitals, Mayor Akisoya did not tell you because she doesn't have the time to tell you about the problems, the headaches she has with having electricity in hospitals. She has hospitals where babies are dying every day because the power goes out. People die because in surgery, the power goes out. Of course, you cannot have uh, um, food processing, uh, uh, better irrigation systems without power. So I just wanted, first of all, to lay the case that for climate resilience, you're going to also need access to affordable, reliable, sustainable energy services. Also, we need to note that we need to have climate justice. Africa contributes only 2% of energy-related carbon dioxide emissions. Only 2% of energy-related CO2 to emissions. Why is that important? Most of the greenhouse gases are generated, two thirds of them, from either energy production or energy use, transportation, industrial energy efficiency, heating and cooling of buildings. So if Africa is contributing 2% or less, 
it means there needs to be climate justice because those who are polluting are mainly the industrialized countries, including our neighbors in Europe. Uh, it, it is uh, uh, Mary Robinson, former president of uh, uh, Ireland, who always in our meeting talks about climate justice. So I want to, the, the minister, the opening talks about political rationality. I want to talk about enlightened self-interest for Europe, given the numbers that the minister showed, that in fact helping Africa transform, develop, and build climate resilience means we are helping Europe as well. Why? With this massive population growth, adding another billion Africans in another 30 years to our population, of course, if they move to the cities, the next place is to go to Europe. So it is in our enlightened self-interest and Europeans' enlightened self-interest to talk about a new cooperation within the European New Deal to push for economic prosperity and growth in Africa as potential markets for Europe, but also to stem that migration. We want as business partners, not as illegal aliens. And already with this kind of demographics and massive urbanizations in cities where you don't have power, you don't have uh, uh, factories and industries, and of course the planning that Mayor just mentioned, it just becomes a holding station for kids to move either through the Sahara on boats to come to Europe. So it is in, in, in Europe's enlightened self-interest that we partner now in a new uh, um, uh, partnership over the next 20 years, particularly this decade, 10 years before 2030, to define how together we can all approach net zero emissions, but with creating wealth and jobs in their neighboring uh, 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 countries in Africa. So that's the first premise I wanted to give. Let me give you another worrying statistic. 700 million Africans live in locations that have temperatures that exceed 25 degrees centigrade. By 2040, that's going to be 1.2 billion, meaning they're going to need cooling systems, fans. That's a huge demand for energy. So you begin to see that climate change, we are bearing the worst brunt of climate change already. And if current trends continue, and more emissions by our neighbors and the rest of the world, because carbon has no passport, it means we suffer more. And if we suffer more with increasing demographics and urbanization, they have not. I think that is important for our European friends and others to understand why we are in this together. That in defining a new relationship post-COVID, we understand that we must work together in a new partnership that is win-win, creating wealth down south, but also creating economic opportunity as well and uh, climate security for Europe. I wanted to lay that as a premise. And of course, energy is central to all of that. Affordable, reliable, sustainable energy. And of course, Europe has the technology, the know-how mm. that we can use to be able to create that post-COVID the world that in fact uh, would, would be win-win and spreads prosperity for all of us. I can later on talk about what we're trying to do to achieve that collaboration, but I just wanted to lay that premise. And in fact, I'm talking to you from my constituency, just behind me is a huge river. And uh, Mayor Akisoya knows a place called Yeliboya. It is one of our three sinking islands and it's in my constituency, one of them. It's already going to be fully submerged in another two decades. Mm -hmm. So I'm talking to you from a place that is already one of the most vulnerable due to sea level rise. Over to you. Oh, well, thank you so much uh, for that, uh, Dr. Yumkela, for, for really painting the picture for us from an energy perspective. And you're quite right. I do want to pick up with you on, on what that collaboration looks like. Uh, you talked about how the European technology can be uh, brought to the continent so that we can mitigate and... and, and create uh, sustainable energy. But I, I have some interesting questions, Dina, that I do want to uh, pass one of them to you. Um, an anonymous uh, member of our audience um, is asking about the rural urban migration. And I think it's a very good point uh, the question is making. Um, I'll read it verbatim, uh, Dina. Has rural urban migration, due to the impact of environmental stress, actually contributed 
to improving livelihoods and um, reducing poverty, right? Or is it just making increasing vulnerabilities in the city? So can we correlate people moving to the cities with, with a reduction in poverty or are we just migrating the poverty and hardship elsewhere, Dina? I think this is a very good uh, question. And I realize that whenever we speak of migration, we have almost an obligation of nuances. We can't escape it. And you can look at migration, in fact, as a barometer of resilience and vulnerability in many cases. So you have situation where migration is a strategy for uh, at the level of the community or of the family. One person goes to the city, not everyone leaves. Yeah. And then there are returns through skills and remittances. And there's a contribution to maintaining, in fact, activities in the rural area and in the agriculture sector through these internal remittances. And you have the same phenomena with movements abroad where there are returns of investments and remittances and skills back home. And in the same time, you have situation where on the contrary, you have increased vulnerability. And there are different types of vulnerabilities we are seeing, then that's the complexity of migration situation, because of course we do have slow onset processes. So you have desertification, loss of biodiversity, you have deforestation, you have land uh, salinization from the sea level rise. Uh, you have all this very slow onset where you will have migration more like an adaptation strategy of the families to the, what they perceive even as environmental change. And you have very sudden onset disaster, floods, typhoons. Uh, it's really what happens when you have really a push on displacement. And there we are talking about a very different kind of uh, migration flow, very forced, uh, tragic, where people lose very often everything. If you don't have insurance of your uh, housing, you lose also what your belongings are and you lose your, your identity. So we speak of very tragic forms of migration or leading to poverty and that goes into the urban swell very much. And we see also an increased level of different types of vulnerabilities. We have some um, research now that shows, for instance, that trafficking in persons, unfortunately, uh, is growing at the moment of disaster when uh, the capacity of the government is overwhelmed, in fact, to, to protect. And we have this complexity of migratory movements that are combined. So I think it's a very good question where there is a response of uh, yes and no, because there is, a, as I said, a barometer of resilience and vulnerabilities. And there are many key questions to consider, for instance, gender questions in such situations. So I find, um, yes, that's one of the, the discussion we, we can have. I think there, there's no one solution fits all, first of all. So I think we'll have to go into different types of understanding of how we can respond also to different kinds of migration uh, challenges that are posed by climate change and by the uh, urbanization. Uh, that leads then, I think, to a question of governance that the mayors have mentioned before. The, there's the slow onset, you have the sudden onset, but then you have the governance issues. Uh, water sanitation, water management, clean energy, uh, transportation, uh, education, access to electricity, to health, uh, and the whole thing that this leads very much to, to very vulnerable urban settings and an impact also on the environment, increased deforestation and um, people living in, in flood, for instance, areas where they shouldn't even live. So I think we have this very complex situation of migratory movements of very diverse, uh, very diverse type. Yeah. Uh, but if I can say just one thing to this question, it's I really think that we have also to stop seeing migration just negatively. And this is a key message from my side. I think we have to look also at migration as a part of the solution. And to really consider, especially, I think, the internal displaced people, the migrants, the diaspora, the communities, as very positive actors of climate action. And that's part of the, the work that ILM does. I can give you more examples on that. But I really think as a vision, 
that's something I really want to, to bring to the table today. And to, of course, there are questions, deep questions of vulnerability and very strong uh, examples of people who are, who are just the, the driving force of change. And we should do right. everything we can to empower them. Okay, thank you so much, Adina. And I knew you would be well placed uh, to tackle that one for us. A very good question. Thank you so much to ever put that that one through. Of course, it isn't a very simple answer, but there are uh, success stories when it does come to migration. So it, it's not completely a straightforward one, as Dina has been able to to so elaborately uh, put for us. Um, Maya, I have another question that I do want to uh, pose to you. This again coming from somebody in the audience. Um, somebody is raising the issue of, uh, and I'll, I'll ask this to you directly and read it verbatim, uh, Mayor Akisoya. Don't you believe that the uncontrolled demographic growth is part of the climate change problem? Uh, don't you believe that there should be strong campaigns as well on birth planning and birth control? Uh, just your views uh, to that one. Um, this is somebody in the audience asking this question. Uh, Mayor, if you can take that for us. Um, thanks. I, again, like with the question to um, Dina, this isn't simple. Um, you need to that that's you know, to say demographic. Look, from a health perspective, we know that women benefit from having birth control, from using birth control to be able, for being able to plan uh, um, childbirth, to be able to plan managing families. Family planning is an essential part of being more independent and growing economies. Um, but to have a blanket statement which links demographics to climate change or climate uh, control, I think it's, it's, it's sort of walking on a bit on dangerous ground. Um, it's certainly not a statement that I think I would feel comfortable making. Um, I would I would split those conversations, and I would say that that uh, uh, um, there is data to confirm the fact that women's own potential. Um, as individuals to, to, to make the most of their lives, to, to, to um, be more economically secure, um, is enhanced if they have access. I will say that. Um, I, will not, I will not link the two like that because, because I think that's just, yeah, I just think that's a dangerous kind of statement. So, yeah. Okay. Now, and and can I quickly say something on Dina's point? Uh, yeah, uh, absolutely. Yes. Being positive. Um, Dina, I couldn't agree with you more. Um, and we know that during COVID, all over the world, we saw that it was in so many cities. It was migrants who were healthcare workers. It was migrants who were um, working in the grocery stores. It was migrants who were keeping uh, um, the basic services going. And here in Freetown, we have um, introduced strategies to improve uh, sanitation. A key element of that is really promoting household waste collection through setting up micro enterprises. Um, and those, these are sort of these are um, cooperatives, groups of about six to ten young people, um, with whom the city goes into an arrangement. We give them a waste tricycle. Um, so because of the informality and hard to reach areas and they go house to house collecting garbage and we provide an inf uh, we provide the enforcement enabling environment this is, is part of a wider value chain for improving sanitation in the city but we recently did a, 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 a um, survey of our the 600 800 odd um, young people in this scheme 70 percent of them are rural migrants 70% of them are rural migrants. And these guys and girls um, are playing a critical role in our city. They're, they're, they're not only providing a valuable service, but they're also making a living um, and they're growing businesses. So migration definitely can very often, um, and in fact, in all circumstances, has the potential to be positive. It's really how we both on the, as host societies or communities and recipient societies and communities, how we interface with the process. Thank you so much uh, for that, Mayor. Dr. Yumkel, I do want to bring you back into the conversation. Again, I have uh, another uh, question from one of our members in the audience that I would like to direct uh, to you. Somebody is asking here, uh, Dr. Yumkela, what we can do to close the uh, 
the infrastructure financing gap in African cities. Is there a possibility that closing this gap helps the residents of cities to cope with the impacts of climate change? So it is that infrastructure, that financing uh, gap that uh, the, the, the member is asking here. So over to you and also um, do feel free, uh, Dr. Yumkele, to address perhaps some of the other things uh, that have come up uh, so far in the conversation. There is definitely a huge financing gap for infrastructure development in general, but let me also uh, say to you that the challenge has been exacerbated by COVID. The International Energy Agency, two weeks ago in a ministerial conference we had on energy, African energy sector, showed that investments in the energy sector, for example, dropped by 30%. And for the first time in seven years, we have seen increase in the number of people without access to energy. So there's a huge financing gap for infrastructure in general, for cities in Africa, but also particularly for investments in, in, in the energy sector. One of the efforts being made now to define this new partnership between Europe and Africa that would also include investments and finance, one of those initiatives we launched last week and it, was, it is sponsored by the EU Commission, the African Union Commission, Friends of Europe, and the Mo Ibrahim Foundation, is a new Africa-Europe foundation that will look at uh, about five pillars, investment in energy systems, digitalization, agriculture, um, cities, and also generally jobs. Um, here, there's a lot, we're going to have quite a bit of discussion on innovative financing, uh, blending and uh, risk mitigation financing, which means that yes, EU will have, will mobilize some of their aid money to go into private sector areas that can leverage additional capital from markets. So we're working in this new partnership. I myself will be chairing the energy strategy group together with Connie Hedegaard, who used to be the former commissioner for uh, climate of the, of, of the EU. Um, so there are these efforts going on. But what uh, Mayor Akisoya mentioned is important. Money comes in when there is a good plan and when there is the right public policy environment that will create the confidence in investors to come in. They need to see a long-term plan for a city. They need to see the long-term infrastructure plan, but also the public policy that will ensure that their, their money is safe, that will ensure that in fact, and, and, that, and, that, and that these policies are not just there for four years. Longevity of the public policy matters over 10, 20 years, because we're talking long-term investments. Um, I want to emphasize that we also need a creative way of using aid money to build institutions and capacity in countries to be able to use that aid properly. Um, aid alone is not going to do it. We need quite a bit of uh, private investments to come in. I give you the case of Africa. For energy, for example, we need at least $50 billion a year for the next 20 years to be able to help Africa achieve universal access to electricity. Yeah? That kind of money cannot come from aid. Yeah. But some aid money used properly to get the right public policy in, space, in place, the right planning models, um, and some de-risking finance in banks can encourage private sector to come in. So it's a big challenge getting money. You'll hear bankers saying, we have money, but we don't have good bankable projects. Or some countries are too risky because public policy changes too quick. If, for example, Mayor Akisoya has already put some plans in place that were developed in a participatory manner, that should be a model for others to follow rather than a new government coming in dishing that out and tries to reinvent the wheel. And that happens in Africa. Forgetting that infrastructure is a long-term process. It's 20, 30 years. So investors need confidence that a policy or a plan will be there. And therefore, in developing that plan, it was participatory and it is approved by their parliament. So an investor is protected for the long haul because they have to borrow money to come in. But uh, the other uh, uh, issue that came up two weeks ago from the International Energy Agency study is that the cost of borrowing is also increasing in Africa. 
So you, you see the, it's almost triple whammy. We already had problems. COVID has added its own, and now you also have the risk of climate change. Borrowing is becoming difficult. Investments have dropped by 30% in the energy space, and I'm sure it's affecting others, uh, other investments uh, as well. So it's a big challenge, but that's why we need this partnership with other countries. We've not talked enough. I think you saw it in the video for Sierra Leone. By the way, I live very close to where the mudslide happened. The, in, in, the, in that video, you had them talk about charcoal and firewood. Mm. I'm also involved in another initiative with WHO, World Bank and others to deal with the crisis of lack of access to clean cooking solutions. And here again, we formed another partnership with the University of Loughborough, Clean Cooking Alliance and the World Bank and several UN agencies. Why? 85% of sub-Saharan Africa depends on firewood and charcoal for cooking and primary health uh, energy needs. So Mayor Akisoya is trying to plant trees, but I assure her in a year they'll be cutting them for firewood. I, I'm going back to Freetown today, and what I do regularly, and I take pictures of all these trucks coming into cities to feed the demand for firewood. Mm. And this is a silent tsunami. It's killing 500,000 Africans every year. It is the second or third largest cause of morbidity. Most of those are women and children. So the forests are disappearing because also for the demand for firewood and charcoal, it's killing a lot of women. But the forests are supposed to be your carbon sinks. So that's another crisis we have. And yes, if 15% if of Sierra Leoneans have access to electricity, it means the rest of their energy demand is from firewood. So you begin to see how much energy is related to problems in cities. And of course, Mayor Akisoya has another headache now. All the trees that were put around when she and I were kids to protect the water dam, they've caught a lot of them and the water table has dropped. So she cannot even be able to supply clean water to the city. So you begin to see what we call the nexus. That's why I created this entity called the Energy Nexus Network to help people understand these interlinkages. Energy, clean cooking, forests, energy, food security, energy health service delivery, and so on. So we have another initiative we call the Health Energy Platform of Action, which we've also launched. We're trying to raise $2 billion to address that problem for women, but also for society. Clean cooking is critical for women's empowerment, for proper uh, clean cities, but also for climate resilience as well. In fact, at this at this juncture in the conversation, perhaps I, I will come to you, uh, Mayor, because um, Dr. Yumkele has thrown a few headaches uh, your way, as he has uh, been characterizing that. I do have some questions for you, but I do want you to just give you the opportunity to first, uh, your hand, you did raise your hand to just perhaps respond to some of what uh, you have been hearing now from uh, Dr. Yumkele. So he made two points, um, one about the fact that when we were growing up, you know, the, the hills of Freetown really were green um, and that the, the water tables have sunk. And I just wanted to say that is, I, mean, I can give you an example from this morning. Literally, I was speaking to a counselor where we have done three attempts now of drilling down 100 um, meters, 100 feet, uh, without getting water. The, the, these are in areas where s literally streams were flowing before, and it's all to do with the deforestation. He mentioned the clean cooking fuel, the fact that 82% of, of um, energy for, for cooking in Freetown is actually firewood. Um, and he also said, Mayor, you're planting the, the trees, but they're gonna cut the trees down. So I want to say that this is about also investment in institutions. Yeah. So we, we actually have introduced an app. So we created a concept of tree stewards um, and growing teams. We didn't just go out and plant a bunch of trees. So we, we've actually got um, over 300 young people, uh, plus any resident in Freetown could be a tree steward. So trees are planted in your backyard, in schools, in offices, but then also in open spaces. Institution investments comes back to my earlier point about devolution.
When you have a situation, which is what you would have in other parts of the world, where the city government is responsible for land use planning, then you know that you can protect areas. You, and even if you have national protected agencies at the national level, there's still a collaboration. But where you have a system such as what we have pertaining in Freetown at the minute or in Sierra at the minute, where the Ministry of Land literally is giving building permits for homes to be built in the middle of protected areas, in the middle of waterways, even in one instant, in a canal. Um, and, you know, the idea was the person would put it on stilts. That, that, that misalignment, which, you know, comes back to a lack of real investment in institutional integrity, you know, a real belief mm. and appreciation that climate change is real, it's urgent, it needs right. to be addressed, but simply devolve to the councils um, and allow, allow these policies to, 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 be, to be embedded, you know, for us not to be doing something and looking over our shoulder because it could be undone by another agency. Um, that's a complexity which needs, which, which we collectively need to address because this is a global problem. Nobody stands in the, as an island when yes. it comes to climate change. Yes. Uh, May I do want to stick with you there because another point that Dr. M. Keller was making was that, that continuity uh, that investors needed, that, that certainty, that surety that investors needed that they often don't get from the continent as he was putting it. Um, how are you going about trying to secure uh, the kind of investment that you need uh, to be able to, to, to cope and, and to, to, to make Freetown uh, a sustainable city? Um, I know that you've obviously got your industry experience in, in, in the finance sector, uh, in the private sector. Just, just tell us about some of the things that you're doing. Is, is Freetown perhaps a model that, that we could be looking to? Um, Dr. Jung Keller mentioned um, a participatory approach. So when I came into um, office in in, 19, in 2018, uh, one of the first things I did in alongside our quick win of doing the flood mitigation um, was also to engage 15,000 residents of the city over a sort of eight week period. Um, and that was to, to hone in on what it was we we're going to prioritize. Sanitation and environment were there, but you can't do everything. So um, we we came up and we, we moved from the community participation to technical working groups. So it took us like five to six months and we developed Transform Freetown. Transform Freetown is our roadmap for the city. It has four clusters, resilience, human development, healthy city and urban mobility, and 11 priority sectors. And importantly, it has 19 specific targets. And I guess that's perhaps what um, Dr. Junkeller was talking about, about having plans that um, can people can relate to, whether it's the private sector, whether it's um, international partners, philanthropists, um, you've got a plan, you're sticking to the plan, um, and that, that does really help. And of course, as you mentioned, you know, with a private sector finance background, it does, that also helps as well, because you kind of, you, there's, you're getting some of the pieces coming into the puzzle, um, perhaps a little bit easier because you're not having to get other people to do that with you or for you. Um, so for Freetown, we, that continuity starts with a plan. Yeah. It's a plan to 2022, but it won't be complete in 2022. What's important is building strong institutions so that plans, plans are allowed to go through um, and don't get changed when the next person comes into office because there are plans written for 25 years, plans written for 10 years. And with a change of government, they get thrown out the door. Yeah. I almost want to be a little bit ridiculous and say, I don't know what, what the fuss about continuity is about because we often have um, people staying in power longer than many people would like in the electorate. Uh, that looks like a whole lot of continuity uh, to me. But of course, this is a very separate conversation. And thank you for that, for just outlining, uh, Mayor Akisoya, the, the Freetown uh, case and, and just what we can look to. And I think that's certainly one that we'll be watching, uh, watching the work that you're doing in Freetown. I'm sure that that could be uh, sort of replicated in, in cities, uh, major cities, uh, growing cities across uh, the continent. And I guess these are the kinds of public service officials that we're looking for on the continent who, who bring fresh ideas uh, to the work that is being done. 
Dina, I do want to come back to you because, of course, this, the, this conversation is, is, is premised on the fact that cities have become hotspots, so to say, because of the, the influx of people migrating uh, to, to the cities. Now, I know that you at the IOM, the International Organization for Migration, uh, you all have been looking at, at policies. Um, you've been developing policies uh, that are, are, are pitted in the migration context. Do you want to just tell us a little bit about that um, and perhaps uh, the, the, the application to the African context? Yes, thank you so much for the question. I think, uh, so I, I work in the IOM's headquarters. I really work at policy level. I'm involved in, in the big processes on the sustainable development goals on the Paris Agreement implementation, on the Global Compact on Migration, the humanitarian agenda. I, can, I think there are maybe 20 of these processes. And the key question is how do we translate this into our actions? And um, I think from IOM's side on this nexus between climate change, migration, and looking a bit more specifically at the urban context, maybe I can translate this policy level into concrete operational examples to showcase a bit the solutions we are looking at. All of them are about working with governments, with local authorities, and a lot of different stakeholders, also uh, with mayors, with uh, civil society, with academics and research, and also with migrants themselves. So I, I try to think how to present this and to cluster this like three big chunks of, of solutions that we, we look at policy approaches. So I would say the first chunk, the big type of approaches we have, it's really to uh, look on how we can support countries in their policies to uh, support people to stay. So not to have to move in a forced way because of climate change and because of disaster. So it's, this is really a call, in fact, for climate action. So it's a lot about policies on climate change, on national adaptation plans, on mitigation, uh, on uh, um, national determined contributions that the countries are committing for the, the climate um, uh, framework convention. So it's about investing in climate action, investing in green jobs. It's about really uh, looking on how you, you give alternative livelihoods to people so they don't have to move. Mm -hmm. And it's also about investing more in disaster risk reduction so that we limit force foremost migration and displacement. We have examples of more urban uh, focused uh, projects now that are quite innovative. Some of them are funded by IOM's own development fund that we have in the institution and that look much more about the urban, very urban uh, agriculture livelihoods. We have an example ongoing on blue economy focus in uh, Kenya, in the Matare uh, River region, that it's much more about uh, plastic also um, management and also about water uh, resource management with uh, the intention to support people not to have to move and to continue to have these livelihoods. We have another example, for instance, in Burkina Faso on uh, urban agriculture, sustaining urban agriculture to, to provide livelihoods to people, also to displace people who are now in the urban context. We have another example, for instance, in Senegal, that it's extremely interesting, uh, where we have um, an example of a space with uh, 56 hectares of agriculture land at the, just at the borders of uh, Dakar that employ, I think, over 150 producers. So you imagine that it, this means a lot of other people employed in this green uh, economy. And we realize that 60% of the people working in this different producer space were migrants. So from Burundi, from Mali, from Gambia. So this is solutions investing for people to, to stay. Then there's a big chunk of solutions to support people who are already on the move because of climate change or disasters. There we speak more about humanitarian responses, uh, about supporting transhuman protocols for people to continue to be in a movement with uh, the, the cattle. We have issues more also on clean energy. So 
So for instance, to solarize our own uh, displacement setting, the humanitarian hub of Marakal in uh, South Sudan is a good example of this. It's about humanitarian protection. Uh, so it's about solutions for people who are already on the move and understanding why they move and where they go to. And we have right. a very interesting example of Djibouti on this, where you have a lot of migration because of climate change to the city of Obok and people stranded there because they want to go further in international migration on the Aden route, Gulf of Aden route, and therefore the moment also stuck, so we work with them in uh, this stranded situation. And the last bit of solution I wanted to highlight to you, it's really, it's about solution for people to move. So it's really supporting people to engage in regular forms of migration, to engage in, in dignified migration, in where what I was saying before, solution is part of uh, migration is part of the solution. And there we have very interesting new programs. Uh, there's one on uh, agroecology and diasporas investing back home in agroecology. So uh, again, it's about uh, rural and peri-urban areas. We have an example in Morocco that is extremely interesting. And we have a new publication on West Africa and agroecology that I, I would be very happy to share further. Uh, and it's all available on IOM's environmental migration portal. And another example I find extremely interesting and I wanted to mention to you, it's uh, green reintegration. So the idea to reintegrate, uh, to support returning migrants so that they reintegrate with land uh, management, uh, forestation, uh, green jobs, climate resilient jobs uh, back home. And maybe one last thing, a very um, cross-cutting to all these three types of solutions, I think a lot of IAM's investment is also in supporting states to develop policies that connect the climate and the migration agenda mm. and to uh, support capacity building type of programs. Uh, where it's about talking, because very often we see the environment, migration, water, disaster risk reduction, right. climate, don't talk together. So it's pushing also uh, talking together. So that's, I, I try to give you a bit of um, yes. a range of activities. I stop here because uh, <laughs> Thank you. I can go on, I can go on with solutions for long and also yeah, issues yeah. for long. So and, I stop. And of course, if only time would allow, we would, we would, of course, love to hear more of those solutions. But thank you so much for that. We are sort of drawing this conversation to a close. Dr. Yumkel, are you back with us now? Because I, I did want you to quickly just talk about those partnerships that you were envisioning. Okay, so he doesn't appear to be back with us now. But thank you so much. Just in terms of what I think this, this conversation has really come down to here is that migration is actually part of the solution, right? It's a reality. Uh, our people on, uh, from the rural areas here, they're coming to the cities, um, and, and we've heard that urban planning is key, uh, that we need to prepare, we need to have a plan, and those plans need to have continuity that involves investment uh, and everything that requires. Um, we've also heard about the, the opportunities that, that energy, the energy sector presents us. Of course, we have a lot to do in terms of electrifying our continent uh, and getting people access to, to more sustainable forms of energy. So, this is really a conversation that we can go on and on and on for because there are so many facets to this. But I'm so uh, grateful to you uh, all for making it possible uh, to, to be here today to share these insights. So what I will now do, um, Mayor Akisoya and, and uh, Dina, is I will afford you just a 30-second slot for you to just basically give us your, your, your closing remarks, uh, your closing statements. Um, I, I, it's, un it's unfortunate that uh, Dr. Um, Yumkela can no longer be with us, of course. I don't know if you heard at some point, I, I could actually hear the chickens in the background, so he's really in a rural <laughs> setting. So I'm, I'm, I'm actually really pleased about the fact that we were able to get a little bit about him. We saw the trees behind him, and, and he, of course, talked about the fact that where he is, uh, that's, that's a, that's an endangered and a vulnerable part of the world. So this is a very real conversation. So, all right, let's do this. Dina, I, I know you had just spoken, but I do want to come back to you now. 30 seconds of your closing remarks, Dina, uh, and then Mayor Akisoya will come to you for, for the same. Look, I, I just want to reinforce what I strongly believe, and I believe this also from my personal uh, experience that you mentioned at the beginning, I was a refugee. And I realized what you lose when you migrate and what you gain when you migrate. So I really would like to call for a very nuanced 
uh, unbalanced approach. So not migrants, not victims, not heroes, real people who can be part of the climate action and who have specific vulnerabilities that need to be addressed. So let's take all this into account and provide a wide range of, of responses that are necessary because of the complexity of that. Thank you Thank so you. much for that, Dina. Mm -hmm. Mayor, it is your time. Um, I would say that um, rural migrants coming into the city um, are already vulnerable and the absence of clarity around land ownership. Um, and when I talk about urban planning, it's not just in terms of, um, it's not just in terms of planning for sectors, but spatial planning. So, you know, planning for, for development um, and particularly given the fact that we are where we are uh, with the creation of so many slums, participatory neighborhood upgrading, improving the standard of living of those the, and, the, and the environment of living of many of those who find themselves as rural migrants leaving vulnerability and then becoming more vulnerable. The, the end result will be protection of our environment through planning and, and through protecting areas, but it will also be increasing the economic strength of our communities. And we can't talk about resilience without having a stronger, stronger economies. Thank you so much for that. That's Mayor Akisoya. So, you know, time really flies by when you're, when you're having a good time. And I, I, this hour went by so quickly. Uh, thank you so much. I've personally walked away with a lot uh, from this conversation. I think that in as much as, you know, migration is is, is pitted in, in a way of we've got a challenge. There are many opportunities here, p opportunities uh, for partnership. When we started this day, we had a lot of uh, participants joining us uh, from Europe and Africa. Of course, this, this conversation is also taking place in a context where these two neighboring contexts are sort of re-engaging and then resetting the relationship, one of partnership. Um, and we can certainly see how, how the, the vision is there for partnerships in terms of combating um, uh, challenges that we face as a collective. Um, we've been hearing throughout this conversation that we need to all look out uh, for one another uh, at this time. Of course, there's the COVID pandemic that is raging as, as we speak and, and what it's doing uh, on the continent. Less so much of a health problem, really, but we're seeing what it's doing from an, an economic perspective, a social economic perspective. So that's also a big part of the conversation that we would have liked to get into. Um, but of course, the good news is the conversation is not over. Um, we have a panel again tomorrow, and that would be the closing 